Today is the final sermon in our sermon series on gospel lessons from Ted Lasso. I thank you for all your input and suggestions, and it's been fun to explore um, these important ideas that have uh, taken root in our culture. Let me take a moment and welcome those of you who are worshiping online, also those of you who are in the fellowship hall. We're so glad that we have an expansive worship life here and uh, hope that it reaches as many as possible. Today's scripture reading um, comes from Colossians chapter 3. Hear now the word of God. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you indeed were called in the one body. And be thankful. May God add understanding and insight to this word. One of my favorite slices of life around this church happens on Saturday evenings when two people who look more beautiful than they ever have and perhaps ever will stand on these steps and they pledge their love to one another. It's hopeful and it's joyful and some would say it's extraordinarily naive. I will love you forever no matter what who in their right minds actually believes that, and yet here people stand year after year, generation after generation, pledging a profligate, extravagant, forever kind of love to each other. I've been married now for exactly 104 years, and the truth be told, sometimes I'm really not lovable at all and not loving I'll spare you the gruesome details, but the fact of the matter is it takes a tremendous amount of forbearance and forgiveness and grace to stay in any kind of long-term relationship, and especially one that bears the weight and the commitment of marriage. In recent years, I've been heartened to notice that the couples to be married are trending away from these highly romantic readings like Pablo Neruda's love sonnets, and they're trending toward the more substantive words, especially the ones that we just read from the Apostle Paul, clothe yourselves with kindness, compassion, humility, meekness, and patience, bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must must forgive. And every time we read these words in this candlelit sanctuary on a Saturday night, I want to pause and look at the gleaming faces standing in front of me and ask them, did you notice that patience is mentioned once, kindness once, humility once, but forgiveness three times? Anyone married for longer than, say, a whole month can tell you why. So the context for this writing and this reading is this. The Apostle Paul's ministry um, has come to Colossae, and the people have received him. And in the good news of Jesus Christ, they have experienced this radical inward transformation. Their former lives were defined by all the typical identity markers of their society, race, nationality, class. And then along comes the Apostle Paul who says, well, what's actually most true about you, your most clear defining characteristic is that you belong to Jesus Christ. That's who and whose you are. You're not Greek, not Jew, not Gentile. You're not red or blue, not male or female. You're certainly not liberal or conservative. None of those arbitrarily binary categories. What's most true about you is that you are beloved children of God. It reminds me of the last words we used to say to our children as they raced out the door to school to catch the bus. We would shout out, remember who and whose you are. And then almost always, and don't forget your lunch. Because the point that Paul is making to these newly minted Christians is to make sure that their new inward reality is reflected in outward expression. That who they are and how they understand themselves influences and dictates their behavior. This is a big ask on Paul's part, especially since they had long been defined by the prevailing Hellenistic values. And earlier in chapter 3, Paul outlines exactly what those not-too-attractive characteristics are. 
anger, malice, slander, deceit, greed. But now, Paul says, as people who belong to Jesus Christ, you are to be humble uniters, not fiery dividers, slow to take offense, quick to assume the best, and above all, marked by forgiveness, because in Christ, God has forgiven you. You know, here at Covenant, we've actually baked this behavioral aspiration into our vision statement for this congregation. We print it on the front page of the bulletin every week. It's on the front page of our website on purpose. Covenant Presbyterian is a dynamic Christian community that gladly invites all people, not some people, all people to come and experience this church community as a transformational experience of faith. That means that we are not going to stay the same, that we're going to be changed and transformed through grace. Here we boldly proclaim the gospel. Here we bravely work toward a whole and just world. That's what today's mission festival is all about. It's about bravely working toward a whole and just world. We hope you'll support it. And here we passionately nurture Christian discipleship. The assumptive basis behind this vision statement for this community is that by participating in this faith community, by serving and worshiping and learning here, that we'll grow into Christ-likeness, that we'll gain new perspectives, we'll drop old prejudices, we'll repair broken relationships, and we will live according to the pattern of the one that we call Lord. That's not always easy, is it? It's not for me. I'd imagine it's not for you. So in an article entitled The Anonymous Christianity of Ted Lasso, Daniel Horan suggests that the reason we find this series so compelling is that Lasso actually puts to practice the most difficult principles of Christian faith. We see this clearly in episode 9 of season 1 when the team owner of the Richmond Football Club, the soccer club, Rebecca Welton, confesses that she purposely set Ted up for failure. She tried to use him as a tool for revenge against her estranged husband, Rupert. Let's watch. So in a world where we say love deserves love and hurt deserves hurt and violence deserves violence. Jesus invites us into a world where love and forgiveness rule, a world where we interrupt this seemingly endless cause and effect cycle of conflict and and through forgiveness actually create the possibility of a new future. Now, sometimes when I speak on this topic, people will talk back, sometimes through email, usually just muttering internally, but they'll, they'll mutter things like this. But doesn't, doesn't even the Bible say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? What about justice and all this forgiveness, clothe yourselves in love stuff? Is, there's really no way to be in a relationship or to run a world. And folks who say this are right, at least partially about the eye for an eye part, that is in the Bible. It's in Leviticus 24. And a man who injures his countrymen as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Just as another person has received injury from him, so it will be given to him. That comes from the Code of Hammurabi. It's a tribal code that was in place in society 500 years before the time of Moses. And scholars point out that the code's intent is to regulate the natural human inclination to overreact. That any retribution, this Code of Hammurabi says, is to be limited to an eye for an eye. It's not mandatory eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It's only eye for eye and tooth for tooth. When wrong is done, the punishment must be constrained to fit fit the crime. But here's the interesting part, is Jesus knew that code. He'd been raised in it. He'd been steeped in that code his whole life. But as an adult, he brought a message of a better way. He taught that we are actually to do good to those who hate us, to bless those who curse us, to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, and most of all, to forgive, just as we have been forgiven. And then we are to clothe ourselves with love, which Paul says binds up all things, all our virtues, in perfect harmony. 
It's a new behavioral code based on the regenerating power of love rather than the threat of retaliation. So simply put, for Christians, retaliation is a moral failure. As one person observed, an eye for an eye merely leaves two people blind. Besides, it doesn't work. It doesn't heal. It doesn't create new possibilities. It doesn't lead to life. So perhaps it's time for us to listen to Jesus, to entertain the notion, at least, that Jesus is really the ultimate pragmatist. The Apostle Paul certainly thought so. So he said, as God's chosen one, forgive each other. Just as God has forgiven you, so you also should give. Then put on love. A scene we saw earlier from Ted Lasso in which Rebecca confesses Ted forgives. It it continues with Ted expressing the need to put on a kind of love that actually leads to redemption. Let's listen. So forgiveness is hard, no doubt about it. It can be deeply complex. It is almost always painful. It's a process that may take weeks or months or years, maybe even decades, especially if some kind of personal abuse is involved. And I don't know whether to think it's encouraging or depressing that no less a spiritual giant than C.S. Lewis once wrote, finally, after 30 years of praying to forgive someone, God finally gave it to me as a gift. Certainly, any generous forgiveness will require God's help. Lewis continues by saying this, to be Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. This is hard. It's perhaps not so hard to forgive a single great injury, but to forgive the incessant provocations of daily life, to keep on forgiving the bossy mother-in-law, the bullying husband, the nagging wife, the selfish daughter, the deceitful son. How can we do it? Only, I think, by remembering where we stand, by meaning our words when we say in our prayers each night, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Without a doubt, this is Jesus' hardest teaching. But I have to wonder how many marriages might be changed? Or how many families salvaged? How many friendships reclaimed? How many churches would be restored? How many lives can be redeemed? If we will embrace this new ethos, this fundamental moral ethical shift from the limited retribution from a code of Hammurabi to the forgiveness that Christ proposes, extending to others the grace that we so gladly accept for ourselves, and then putting on love, which binds up all those other virtues in perfect harmony. I I think it's worth a try. I hope you think so too. All thanks be to God. Amen.